This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Liberty or Death, The American Insurrection. Liberty or Death, The American Insurrection was released in 2016 by GMT Games and supports up to four players. This game was designed by Harold Buchanan and takes three to six hours to play. Liberty or Death is the fifth volume in the Counterinsurgency or Coin series by GMT Games. The Coin series of games simulates counterinsurgency throughout history rooted in guerrilla warfare and clashing political ideologies. This fifth iteration of the series focuses on the Revolutionary War. Four players will assume the role of the British and the Indians versus the Patriots and the French for control of early America. However, this is not just a simple area control game. Territories may be taken for resources, but ultimately, the hearts and minds of the people living there must be won over as well. Each of the four factions has unique gameplay abilities with distinct political opportunities to win the game. So, if this sounds interesting, then stick around because we're going to learn to play Liberty or Death, The American Insurrection. Liberty or Death, The American Insurrection is a GMT game and as such is much more complex than anything I've taught in Harsh Rules period to date. This first episode will cover the fundamentals of the coin system and this entry's overall mechanics. This first episode will serve as a foundation for our later episodes that will go much deeper into the game. So with all that said, let's get started. This is the game board for Liberty or Death, The American Insurrection. This is a gorgeous board with a lot of complexity that may seem daunting at first, so let's break it down a piece at a time to better learn how to read it. To begin understanding the layout, let's first simplify the board's territory spaces. These spaces can be categorized into four types, colonies, cities, reserves, and finally an island space called the West Indies. The dot at the bottom of the territory space banner indicates the type of territory. The white dot is for colony spaces, yellow for cities, black for reserves, and tan for the island, the West Indies. The number inside the dot indicates the population of each space. Colonies and cities represent a significant population for the time and are either a 1 or a 2. Reserve spaces and the single island space are sparsely populated and show a 0. Two key gameplay indicators are tracked on the territory space's banner. First, let's discuss the control area on the left side of the banner. This section indicates which side in the conflict controls that particular space with their military. A territory space can be controlled by the British or the Patriots. If a territory space is not controlled by either side, this section is left empty and considered uncontrolled. Control is determined by the number of game pieces each side has in the territory space. Each game piece for the Patriots or the French counts as one point of control towards taking over that territory space. Likewise, each British or Indian game piece counts as one point of control for that side. The side with the most game pieces has control of the space and places their control marker on the left side of the banner. Each side wants to control as many spaces as possible because each controlled space grants one resource point. Resources represent the game's currency that fund the player's actions. For example, if the Patriots had two game pieces in the Pennsylvania colony, this would give them two control points and control of the colony. However, if the British and Indians place three units, they would have three control points and then they would control the colony. For the purpose of control, the type of game piece does not matter. They're each worth one point regardless. The exception to this rule, and buckle up because there's a lot of exceptions in the coin series, is that Native American units do not score control points unless accompanied with British units. 
so the British and Indian players need to keep that in mind. Now, let's talk about the section on the right side of the banner. One of the mechanics that make coin games so interesting is just because one side's military controls a territory space doesn't mean that the people that live there like it. That's why on the right side of the banner, players keep track of that space's influence. The influence section is where players track a territory space's support or opposition to the American insurrection. Essentially, this is the current state of the hearts and minds of the people that live there. Influence is ranked on a five-point scale. The center of the scale is neutral, and at this point, the population has not decided whether they support or oppose British rule. The population can be swayed two levels to either side of the conflict. The current state of influence is tracked by placing the appropriate marker on the right side of the territory space banner. The Patriots can persuade the populace to earn passive opposition or persuade even further for active opposition. Likewise, the British can exert their influence to achieve passive support or even further to active support. However, in the case of reserve spaces or the island space, the West Indies, the population is too sparse and the influence level is always neutral. Winning the hearts and minds of the people is important because it adds influence points to one side's overall score. Shifting influence grants a multiplier to that territory space's population number. A passive level influence marker grants a multiplier of 1 to the population. An active level influence marker grants a multiplier of 2 to the population. For example, shifting influence of a city with a population of 2 to an active influence level will multiply the population by 2 to award 4 points of influence towards winning the game. The overall British score called Support and the overall Patriot score called Opposition is updated on a numbered track that runs up the left side of the board and across the top. These markers are continually updated throughout the game as the political landscape changes. There are two main ways to modify a territory space's influence. The Patriots can implement propaganda campaigns to shift the populace's feelings against the British and towards opposition. On the other side of the conflict, the British can coordinate with their Native American partner to conduct raids. Raids terrorize the people in territory spaces aligned with the opposition, who then look to England for protection. These raids push the citizens' alignment back towards neutral. Influence is critical because this is one of the key metrics used to determine who wins the game. So in summary, take control of territory spaces to generate resource currency to fund your actions and build influence to win the game. Next, we're going to take a look at the game pieces for each faction. All of GMT's counterinsurgency, or coin games, use abstract game pieces to represent historical forces. Each shape represents a specific type of unit with certain abilities. For establishing control of a territory space, all of these pieces are worth one point each. However, each piece also has a specific battle point contribution as well. We will cover off on these specific numbers as they relate to battles in a later tutorial. For now, let's just get familiar with the various pieces. Cubes represent formal armed forces such as soldiers and police. These units are always armed and visible. Octagon-shaped cylinders represent non-formal supporters such as partisans, militia, resistance, and guerrillas. In Liberty or Death, the blue octocylinders stand for Patriot Militia. The tan octocylinders represent Native Americans, or Indian forces, who are not part of formal established society. Octocylinder units can be rotated to indicate whether these forces are underground and blended in with their environment, or visible in an active military role. In coin terminology, forts and villages are considered bases. Depending on the faction, multiple soldiers or guerrillas can be merged with a specific command 
to create a fort or village. Forts and villages are useful for many reasons. They aid in recruitment and battle, provide shelter during the winter quarters period, and their number is a victory condition for the Patriots and the Indians. Each faction has a set number of soldiers, guerrillas, and bases. The chosen game scenario will determine how many of these units will begin on the board. For the remainder of the pieces not actively in play, it's up to that player to manage their game actions called commands and special activities to get these forces on the board. For some factions like the French, who begin the game out of the war, this comprises a major part of their gameplay. Finally, each faction always has one leader in play. A leader marker contributes special capabilities to that player. Some factions like the British and Indians select from multiple leaders. However, only one leader can be in play per season. The game provides the players with flat round markers or square standees that can be stood upright on the game board. It's up to the player's preference which component they prefer. The game mechanics and narrative are driven by decks of historical event cards. Each deck is shuffled and stacked in a sequence of campaign years that comprise the length of the Revolutionary War. A special card called Winter Quarters is seated at the end of each deck and indicates the end of that particular campaign season. Let's take a quick look at the cards themselves and I'll show you how they're organized. When the game begins, two cards are drawn from the top of the stack. The first card is the active card in play. The second card is considered on deck and will be the next card to become active once the first is played out. When this card shifts to active, the next card is drawn from the stack to be on deck, and so on. Event cards are shuffled into decks according to their time period during the Revolutionary War. The time period is indicated by the range printed in the upper left hand corner of the card. The top of the event card lists each faction's flag in a sequence indicating the order of play for that event. The center of the card has some historical flavor in the form of a picture and title to get players grounded. The bottom of the card describes how the event may impact gameplay and is organized into two sections. The first section, if chosen, typically favors the British and Indian side. The second shaded section typically favors the Patriots and the French side. Now let's take a quick look at how these cards drive the sequence of gameplay. Event cards are used to execute the sequence of player actions that comprise the bulk of the game. At the bottom of the game board is a flowchart that organizes gameplay. Each faction is represented by a colored cylinder with their emblem, called an eligibility marker. At the beginning of a particular round, these cylinders are placed in the eligible faction space in this area. When an event card is drawn, the order of play of the factions is established at the top of the card. The first player will then choose which of the three paths to follow. They can choose to execute a command only, execute a command in a special activity, or trigger the event at the bottom of the card. The first player can also choose to pass and remain eligible. Passing also has the additional benefit of granting that player additional resources. For example, if the first faction chose command only no special activity, then the next faction would flow into the limited command box, unless they elected to pass, and then the next faction would flow into the limited command box, and so on. Once two factions have played, their eligibility markers are moved to the ineligible faction section. The next card in the deck then becomes the active event. On the next card, all ineligible factions are skipped in the order of play. The remaining factions will then take an action or pass. Like before, once two factions decide, the card is advanced. 
When the card is changed and a new turn begins, the faction in the ineligible factions box are moved back to the eligible box. The factions that just acted move to ineligible. Players will repeat this cycle to advance through the deck. When the Winter Quarters card appears, gameplay stops. The Winter Quarters card immediately becomes the active card and players will conduct the steps for the Winter Quarters sequence. These steps are outlined at the bottom of the Sequence of Play section on the game board. Once the card effect is resolved, the victory checks are made and other gameplay adjustments are completed, the next campaign year of the war begins and this process is repeated. Now let's review the commands and special activities to understand how players interact with each other on the game board. Game actions are divided into commands and special activities. Each faction's command and special activity has a theme name and a specific impact on the game. We will cover off in greater detail on the nuances of each of these in a future tutorial. Remembering all the unique abilities of each faction can seem pretty daunting. But if you look at the rules, thematically they fall into categories and in how they affect the game. For example, as placing, moving, and removing game pieces, enriching a partner faction, blocking enemy movement, and influencing the population. I've created these icons to help streamline the learning process. Players can also use pawns on the game board to keep track of where they will execute commands, the gray pawns, or special activities, typically the black pawns. Now, let's tie everything together by looking at the winning objectives for the game. Liberty or Death, the American Insurrection has three objectives and four possible victory scenarios. These objectives are checked at the end of a campaign season during the Winter Quarters phase. The first is a primary objective shared amongst all players, which is resolving the American Insurrection. This is the ideological goal amongst the greater population of all the territory spaces on the board. To win the game, the total support or total opposition to British rule must exceed their opponent's score by 10 points. In simple terms, victory goes to the side with the most colonies and cities that either support or oppose British rule. Therefore, players must win the hearts and minds of the locals and score 10 more influence points than their opponents. The first of the secondary goals is the European interests at stake. For France and England, the American insurrection is merely a side story to the main conflict occurring in Europe. To secure a victory for the French or English, one side must have scored greater casualties on their European enemy. The Patriots and the Indians also have a secondary objective, to decide the conflict of American expansionism. On the American frontier, the Patriots continue to expand and defend their borders by building forts. The Indians are also trying to defend their tribal reserves by building villages. To win under this scenario, one of these players must have three forts or villages more than their opponent to win the game. Now, let's be clear. There are four players in this game and there can only be one winner. So with two players on each side, how does this work? Let's talk about the winning scenarios. The primary and secondary objectives are interrelated. Players must manage the primary objective as well as checking on the status of their own secondary objectives. Managing the victory scenarios is fairly complex, so let's talk about the history behind them and understand why this makes sense. First, let's talk about how the European interests relate to the primary objective. From a certain perspective, this conflict is a British civil war. Essentially, this is British people fighting British people for independence. The Patriots have a natural affinity to their fellow countrymen. They just disagree with them right now, violently. The French, on the other hand, do not share these sympathies. Therefore, the Patriots must manage their French allies carefully throughout the game to ensure the focus remains solely on American independence. The Patriots do not want to be subjects of the British, neither do they want to be subjects of the French. They're Americans. If the French are successful in inflicting more casualties on the British, 
In a sense, the Patriots may have won the war, but they failed to truly achieve their independence. America will revisit this theme with General Pershing in World War I. Besides fighting the war, Pershing must manage the politics of keeping the American military as its own distinct national entity and not as a subordinate force of the French or British armed forces. Once again, the outcome of the American insurrection had real historical repercussions for future conflicts and political relations, no matter what side that nation is on. This game captures those nuances of political relations brilliantly. Now, as for the goal of American expansionism, for the Indians, if the British win the war and subjugate the Patriots, they will be reverted to a colony. If the Indians manage their British alliance properly and use this opportunity to beat back colonial expansion of forts and reinforce their own villages, they have a better chance of managing future conflict. However, from the British perspective, if they allow the colonials to build out their defenses, once they've regained control of their colonies, they can easily push back the Indians in future expansion. Therefore, one way to look at these two sets of goals is the primary goal is the current issue at hand, and the secondary goals are the future. One thing is certain, these political subplots lead to additional friction among alliances as they deal with their opponents. This is going to force players to aggressively manage the outcome of the war, as well as the outcome of their own personal ambitions, and this makes for a rich experience in role-playing, as well as alternate historical thinking. And this is one of the reasons why coin games are far deeper than a traditional area control game. And that brings us to the end of our first episode of Learning to Play Liberty or Death The American Insurrection by GMT Games. GMT games are generally more difficult to learn than your average game, but also more rewarding in depth than gameplay. This is one of the most challenging games I've covered on this channel, so bear with me on the pace and complexity of these tutorials. In the next episode in the series, we will learn more about this game as we set up the board and learn about the intricacies of player actions. Until next time, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode. Questions about this game, requests for future Harsh Rules game tutorials, and constructive feedback are all greatly appreciated. Drop a line in the comments section. To be the first notified when this episode and any Harsh Rules episode is placed online, please subscribe to this channel.